Some 4 billion people live in more than 60 countries holding national elections in 2024. And with around 2 billion expected to go to the ballot box, this year may be a pivotal one for democracy. While the 20th century was dominated by the fight between democracy, communism and fascism, it's fair to say democracy came out on top. In the 21st century, many voters are now choosing how much democracy or what kind of democracy they want. Do they favour a more traditional liberal democracy, which is more bureaucratic, but has checks and balances in place to protect citizens and prevent abuses of power? Or are they willing to sacrifice some civil liberties and political stability in favour of a more autocratic system, where leaders hold more power and face fewer restrictions in enacting their policies? Hi, my name is Aaron O'Neill and welcome to our Data On Stage webinar, Elections 2024, Democracy on the Ballot. Today, we'll go on a trip around the world looking at the largest and most notable elections in each region. Throughout the webinar, we'll be using the EIU's Democracy Index to compare democracy levels and types of government or regime in each country. These range from full or flawed democracies in blue to hybrid electoral autocracies in yellow to authoritarian regimes in red. We begin with Asia, and all eyes were on Taiwan in January, where a new president was guaranteed and the issue of Taiwanese sovereignty was at the forefront. Despite improved economic ties in the past decade, China has pursued the issue of reunification with Taiwan more publicly. In the build-up to this election, China was making its presence felt through nearby military exercises, President Xi Jinping's claims of inevitable reunification, and waves of online disinformation thought to have originated on the mainland. Following AI's exponential growth last year, disinformation has already revealed itself as a major threat. Taiwan is seen as having dealt with the issues successfully through fact-checking groups, press conferences, and hiring popular influ influencers to explain the electoral process, but the quality and quantity of misinformation being produced is unprecedented and already threatens election integrity in many countries less prepared than Taiwan. But back to this election, and Vice President William Lai ultimately won Taiwan's presidential election, while the Kuomintang became the largest party. Interestingly, the Kuomintang was the side who fought against the communists in the Chinese Civil War before establishing modern Taiwan. But today, they're often labelled as being more pro-China than the DPP. The Kuomintang and the People's Party originally wanted to field a joint presidential candidate, but failure to agree made it a three-way race, which was likely instrumental, instrumental in handing victory to Lai. In his earlier years, Lai had called for an official declaration of independence, but recently adopted the attitude of his predecessor, and seeks to continue her policy of economic cooperation. Nonetheless, he's been branded a dangerous separatist by Beijing, and it remains to be seen how cross-strait relations develop when he takes office in May. Taiwan is ranked as the 10th most democratic country in the world, while China is 148th. Given the democratic decline in Hong Kong since the handover in 97, especially since the protests of 2019, it's likely any form of reunification would result in significant backsliding in Taiwan. Moving to South Asia, one of the reasons this year is the biggest election year in history is because seven of the world's ten most populous countries have national elections. This includes the three South Asian neighbors, neighbors of Bangladesh, Pakistan and India, home to almost two billion people. Bangladesh kicked off the year's elections a week before Taiwan, with the ruling Awami League retaining their position as the largest party for the fourth election in a row, Sheikh Hasina extended her tenure as the longest serving elected female leader in history. However, the election was not considered free or fair. The opposition boycotted their third election in a row and seats won by independent candidates were mostly affiliated with the Awami League, causing some observers to now describe Bangladesh as a one-party state. Sheikh has been accused of growing more authoritarian dur during her time in office and recent elections were marred by violent protests, the imprisonment of opponents, and accusations of vote rigging. In Pakistan, the election was also marred by protests, imprisonments, and accusations of rigging, but this did not result in a similar landslide victory. 
For context, Pakistan has been in a political crisis since 2022, when Prime Minister Imran Khan was ousted in a move believed to have been orchestrated by the military establishment. This was followed by nationwide protests and assassination attempt, his ban from holding office, his arrest and sentencing to 10 years in prison. Khan's party was also banned from campaigning, candidates were jailed or went into hiding and their symbol was removed from the ballot. The party's cricket bat symbol was unmistakably identified with Khan, a former cricketer who many consider Pakistan's greatest ever player, and as around 40% of the population is illiterate, this was incredibly important for voters to know which party to support. On election day, mobile phone services were suspended across the country and there were even lethal attacks at polling stations. Considering all these facts, many expected a landslide victory for the Muslim League, but Independent candidates won the largest numbers of seats, 93 of which were from PTI members. Additionally, pro-democracy protests were held across the country following the election. A senior election official publicly admitted to vote rigging, while a winning candidate from a smaller party gave up his seat when he discovered the race had been rigged. Nonetheless, the Muslim League became the largest party when reserve seats were allocated and formed a coalition government with Shehbaz Sharif, Khan's replacement in 2022, named Prime Minister again. So while neither Pakistan nor Bangladesh's elections were considered free or fair, the outcome in Pakistan shows that the establishment does not have the same level of control as in Bangladesh. Protesters had more success in making their voices heard, and Pakistan's story may serve as inspiration for future pro-democracy movements across the world. The next question is, does this mean anything for the upcoming election in India? Well, probably not. Politics in India is in a much different state and it is often referred to as the world's largest democracy. The Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP and its leader, Narendra Modi, have been in power for 10 years overseeing India's emergence as a potential economic and political superpower. Throughout Modi's tenure, India's democracy ranking has generally fallen, yet Modi is incredibly popular among the Hindu majority population and is consistently ranked as the most popular world leader among major democratic economies. Western countries also have fairly positive relations with his administration due to economic ties as well as India's growing international influence, which has made it something of a kingmaker in the growing rift between some G7 and BRICS member states. However, while the economy has boomed, Many of Modi's free market policies have been accompanied by public spending cuts, affecting the most vulnerable in society. Modi and his party are also proponents of Hindu nationalism, and many of their more controversial actions have made India's non-Hindus, around a fifth of the population, feel marginalised, especially Muslims. Recent examples include the consecration of the new Ram Mandir Hindu temple on the site of a destroyed historic mosque, or a new citizenship law that makes it easier for non-Muslims to become citizens. But according to Statistics Consumer Insights, issues such as poverty, unemployment and education rank much higher than equality among Indian citizens. And with such high approval ratings, it would appear that Indians believe Modi and the BJP are the best equipped to deal with these challenges. In the case of India's election, taking place from April 19th to June 1st, the question seems not who will win, but rather by how much. Elsewhere in, India, or elsewhere in Asia, Indonesia had a huge election on February 14th, where the controversial retired army general, Prabowo Subianto, won with more votes than any other candidate in history. Iran held its first election since the Masha Amini protests of 2022. A roughly 40% turnout was the lowest since the revolution, and Conservatives won comfortably. And later in the year, both North and South Korea are scheduled to hold legislative elections. In North Korea, all 687 seats in Parliament will be contested. However, voters have one single option in each race, showing that even the most authoritarian regimes still use the electoral process to legitimise their rule. But now, let's move west to Africa. Recent years have been challenging for democracy in this part of the world, with military successfully seizing power 
in seven countries since 2020 and a so-called coup belt now stretching across the continent. Most of these have taken place in former French colonies and are often accompanied by strong anti-Western sentiments, which has seen a weakening of French and American influence, allowing more autocratic countries such as China, Russia or Middle Eastern states to move in and fill this power vacuum. Democracy has been historically fragile in Sub-Saharan Africa, but these coups have weakened it further. Elections in Mali and Burkina Faso have already been postponed, while the leading opposition candidate in Chad's presidential election was killed last month. There is hope, however, in some adjacent countries. Senegal's election was postponed until December, but after pro-democracy protests it, across the country, it took place on Sunday. The opposition candidate won, and a peaceful transfer looks likely. Ghana, the region's most democratic country, will elect a new leader in December, and South Sudan is set to hold its first ever elections since achieving independence in 2011. To the north, European leaders will be paying close attention to elections in Algeria and Tunisia, especially since major deals regarding gas supply and migration were made last year. But the biggest African election in 2024 will be held in South Africa. The African National Congress, the party of Mandela, has comfortably won every election since apartheid's end, although their winning margin has shrunk with time. Many are predicting this may be the first election where they don't win a majority. In anticipation of this result, several opposition parties have pledged to form a coalition to try and end 30 years of ANC rule. For the ANC, however, there is the prospect of forming a coalition with the controversial Economic Freedom Fighters Party, who have recently become the third largest party in the country. For South Africans, the largest issues are economic or crime related. South Africa has the highest unemployment rates in the world at around 30% nationwide and over 50% for youth unemployment, exacerbating issues such as poverty and crime. In addition to a legacy of political corruption, cronyism and scandals, many voters are becoming disenfranchised and turnout rates are falling with each election. Internationally, President Cyril Ramaphosa has attempted to boost South Africa's presence through involvement in the BRICS bloc, attempted peace talks with Russia, or by bringing Israel to the International Court of Justice, but this may not be strong enough to reverse growing dissatisfaction with the party at home. Now, moving north to Europe and the largest domestic election has already taken place in Russia and parts of occupied Ukraine where Vladimir Putin was re-elected as president for an unprecedented fifth term. Western observers do not consider this election to have been free or fair, after anti-war opposition candidates were barred from running, and Putin's most prominent critic, Alexei Navalny, suspiciously died in prison in February. Many Russians spoiled their ballots, with some writing in Navalny's name, but official results claim Putin took almost 90% of the vote making it his largest victory yet. However, this is not the largest election in Europe this year. With over 400 million eligible voters, the European parliamentary elections is the second largest democratic election in the world after India. While Euroscepticism has gradually grown since the early 2000s, there has been a notable rise since 2019. In response to issues such as the slow and overly bureaucratic response to the pandemic, divisions surrounding the EU support of Ukraine, the energy crisis and immigration. Public attitudes towards the EU are more positive than negative in every state, but there is some concern among the more established political groups. The rise in Euroscepticism has accompanied the growth of far-right and right-wing populist parties domestically, who have seen major gains in recent elections. The biggest examples of this are in two of the EU's six founding members. In Italy, Giorgio Maloney's Brothers of Italy party took power in 2022, and in the Netherlands last November, the Party for Freedom caused a huge upset by becoming the largest in the country. This month's snap election in Portugal also showed further signs of this trend, as the Chega party quadrupled their seat count in Parliament. These parties are often very successful in mobilising their supporters to vote in EU elections, 
although recent pro-democracy protests in countries such as Germany and Poland have seen right-wing parties take a hit in the polls. The European People's Party and the Socialists and Democrats have dominated the EU Parliament for decades, but have seen their combined share of seats fall by a third since 2004. With further losses predicted for this election, the biggest winners will likely be the right-wing Eurosceptic groups, Identity and Democracy, and the European Conservatives and Reformists, with some polls suggesting these may become the third and fourth largest groups respectively. Among other issues, such as climate or civil rights legislation, the rise of these groups poses a threat to Ukraine. The most obvious example of this is from Hungary, viewed as Russia's closest ally in the EU, which has created, created numerous obstacles for both the EU and NATO in their support for Ukraine. While it's unlikely these parties will be part of any ruling coalition, their combined seats could be on par with that of the European People's Party, and they may have enough influence to pull Parliament to the right for years to come. Now, one country not participating in the EU election is the United Kingdom. Similarly to India, the next election's outcome is something of a foregone conclusion, with Labour expected to win comfortably. But, unlike India, this is not due to the popularity of one party or candidate, but rather the unpopularity of the current administration. In the last election, Boris Johnson led the Conservatives to their biggest victory in over 30 years, as voters rallied behind the party during Brexit. Since then, Johnson resigned following a series of scandals during the pandemic. His successor lasted just seven weeks in office after causing an economic crisis, and current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been unable to restore public faith in the party. Many voters also blame the Conservatives for worsening the current inflation and cost of living crises due to numerous austerity measures during their 14 years in charge. Labour has had a comfortable lead over the Conservatives since 2022 and will likely benefit from a decline in the Scottish Nationalist Party's support. Elsewhere, the Populist Reform Party is now the third most popular. However, the UK's electoral system means they are not actually projected to win any seats in Parliament but they will likely siphon off much of the support from the Conservatives' right-wing base, which could help swing many constituencies to Labour. The UK is classified as a full democracy, and in this election does not appear to face the same existential threats we've seen elsewhere. Nonetheless, there are still implications for British democracy, such as disinformation, cyber attacks, or whether the next gov government will roll back some of the Conservatives' anti-immigration or anti-protest laws. Moving across the Atlantic, the final region we look at today is the Americas, where I'd like to start by focusing on El Salvador's election in February. In 2019, El Salvador was statistically one of the most dangerous countries in the world, when Nayib Bukele, a political outsider running on an anti-crime platform, won with 53% of the vote. Bukele then implemented a series of policies that give sweeping powers to the police and militarized law enforcement, decimating gang control in the country. A particularly bloody weekend in 2022 resulted in a state of emergency, followed by the mass arrest of over 75,000 people in a country of 6 million. Today, El Salvador's incarceration rates are the highest in the world, with over 1% of the population behind bars. The UN and human rights organizations have widely condemned these methods. In addition to this, Bukele removed the one-term limit for presidents, similar to recent moves by Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. He reduced the number of seats in the Assembly, and El Salvador has seen the largest democratic backslide in the Americas during his tenure. Yet, Bukele is likely the most popular leader in the world, Domestic approval ratings have consistently been around 90% during his tenure, and El Salvador now has the lowest homicide rate in Latin America. Bukele won in a landslide in this year's election. The so-called Bukele effect is also being felt across the region, with Bukele polling higher than domestic politicians in foreign countries, including Ecuador, where last year's election was overshadowed by the murder of a leading anti-crime candidate, and in Mexico, where we turn our attention to next. After decades of progress, recent backsliding in Mexico has seen its status downgraded 
from a flawed democracy to a hybrid electoral autocracy. President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, or AMLO, has consolidated his individual power by weakening the judicial system and cutting funding to areas such as electoral oversight. Last month, thousands of Mexicans mobilized for pro-democracy marches in cities across the country, protesting AMLO's targeting of democratic institutions in an election year. But these marches were not a success and AMLO remains incredibly popular, especially among working and rural populations. His minimum wage hikes have increased wages by over 300% in some areas, while new welfare schemes have already benefited millions of families and will provide long-term financial security that was unthinkable under previous administrations. In addition to his pro-democracy critics, many economists, business leaders and environmentalists are critical of AMO's public spending, while the large role played by drug cartels and criminal organizations in Mexico has seen little significant change. Crime remains the top issue among voters in Mexico, but the current administration is seen to have done well regarding many of the other top issues. Perhaps unfortunately for the Morena party, AMLO is ineligible to run again due to Mexico's one-term limit, but he remains the most important political figure in this race. His popularity transfers directly to the party's prospects in the coming elections, and in recent polls, the Morena-led coalition has a huge lead nationally. AMLO's successor, Claudia Scheinbaum, is also favored to win the presidency, putting her on course to become Mexico's first female president in history. Scheinbaum is expected to continue many of AMLO's most popular policies, but has pledged to make further progress regarding crime, environmental issues, and gender equality. As many Latin American countries only transitioned to democracy in the past three to four decades, the constant popularity of leaders such as AMLO and Bukele show that a large share of Latin Americans are still unconvinced by this form of governing, often believing that strong leaders are more effective than strong institutions. Finally, we turn our attention to the most high-profile election this year, the United States, where a rematch of 2020 is on the cards. A poll from January suggests that almost three in five Americans do not want Joe Biden to run, with his age and cognitive ability being persistent concern. While his support of Israel's invasion of Gaza has grown increasingly divisive. Similarly, over half feel this way about Trump, with numerous court cases overshadowing his campaign, and many voters consider his attempts to overturn the previous election as posing a serious threat to American democracy. Nonetheless, both candidates won their party's nominations easily in two of the least competitive primaries in recent history. A notable development from the Democratic primaries was the protest vote, where an average of 10% voted uncommitted in races with this option to protest Biden's backing of Israel. Whether this will still be an issue in seven months' time or whether a protest vote rate would be so high in a more competitive election remains to be seen. Foreign policy is not considered one of the most important issues for Democratic voters, as these tend to be more related to the economy, healthcare, rights and climate. Yet the old adage of foreign policy can't win an election, but it can lose one, looms heavily in the background. In the Republican primaries, Nikki Haley was Trump's most significant opponent. While Trump still took the nomination comfortably, Haley's voter base holds a large number of Republicans who do not support Trump. With her withdrawal, some speculate that Haley could become Trump's vice presidential candidate in an attempt to win back many of these voters. In terms of issues, the top spot is much clearer for Republicans than among Democrats, with one third naming immigration as their largest concern. Earlier this year, Senate Republicans wrote a bill introducing some of the most restrictive immigration policies in decades, attaching it to a foreign aid bill to get Democratic support. The bill was set to pass, yet Republicans then blocked it, with many speculating this was due to the strength of the issue on the campaign trail. While much of the election coverage will be in terms of Republicans versus Democrats, it is important to remember that more Americans identify as independents than any time in recent decades. Since the election will likely be decided in seven swing states, appealing to independence is more important than ever. 
Trump is currently leading in the polls in all of these states, with at least a six-point lead in the larger states electorally. However, these figures may give Trump a false sense of security. While he's currently leading in polling of the general public, nationwide, Biden has a marginal lead among those likely to vote. Also, with seven months to go, there is ample opportunity for Biden to swing these states blue. Independents care less about immigration and more about economic issues. The US economy has outperformed expectations in recent months and avoided a likely recession. Although many voters may currently feel a disconnect between their personal finances and a growing economy, wage growth overtook inflation last month for the first time in two years. And this is predicted to continue until the election, which could be very positive for the Biden campaign. In terms of democratic stability, many supporters on both sides feel that the opposing candidate is worse for democracy. For Biden supporters, they point to Trump's election interference and the January 6th attack, the influence of his appointees to the Supreme Court, his ownership of a social media platform, and the authoritarian language used throughout his campaign, among many others. For Trump supporters, some view his many court cases as Biden persecuting a political opponent, while they may also consider vaccine mandates or Biden's own mishandling of classified documents as anti-democratic. Either way, this is yet an incredibly polarized race and few can predict what may happen in the coming seven months. To many in the West, the, shot of, the thought of a shift away from democracy may be puzzling at first. However, the pandemic showed that many people supported measures that would be considered undemocratic, such as the restriction and tracking of movements or vaccine mandates. At the same time, people believed that short-term sacrifices were necessary for long-term health and stability. Today, if we look at other existential crises facing many of the countries we just talked about, whether that's crime in El Salvador, poverty in Mexico, or economic opportunity in India, many voters in these countries feel faced with a similar dilemma. The risk, however, is the gradual backsliding will result in the rise of a dictatorship as has happened in Russia and maybe on the cards in Bangladesh and across Africa's coup belt. The want of more democratic societies and the expansion of civil rights is not universal, especially in countries that may have only transitioned to democracy in recent decades. Yet the strength of pro-democracy movements in Taiwan, Pakistan, Senegal, as well as protests across Europe and the US show that a global democratic backslide is not inevitable and may give hope to future generations. Hopefully today give you all some insight into the elections of 2024. Unfortunately, we barely scratched the surface in many of these races. Therefore, be sure to visit our platform where we have thousands of statistics, reports, topic pages and more relating to these issues and the, these elections and the relevant issues. For those of you attending this webinar live, we'll be opening the floor to questions shortly. If you are watching the recorded version of this webinar via our platform or social media, thank you for watching.